started. Um, first of all, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, most of you guys have these monthly, so you already know the restrooms are right here to my left in the floor room here. Um, make sure your phones are on vibrator silent if you are live, live streaming this, so that way people can watch it. I'm really excited today to have Jason Church here from um, the National Park Service. He's a materials conservator. Is your official title? Yes. All right. And um, Nacogdoches? Nacogdoches. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that how it's said? Yeah, Nacogdoches is Texas. Nacogdoches is Louisiana. Okay. So, we're today. So, anyway, he drove here um, this week to uh, do this presentation for us, and then also tomorrow we will be doing a... Uh, uh, workshop, a gravestone conservation workshop out at Greenway Cemetery. So if you guys are interested in that, um, just hit me up after the, the presentation here. So anyway, I guess we'll go ahead and get started and I'll sure. turn it over to Jason. All right. Thank you. We'll see. All right. So introduction. So Jason Church. Uh, I work for the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. We're your tax dollars at work. We're on research office of the National Park Service. We're the only cultural research office. So we have six research labs where we look at evaluating treatments, uh, cleaners, um, you know, coatings, all kinds of things for cultural resources. So I'm a conservation scientist. I work in the labs uh, doing research, looking at um, most of my research is on stone or metal or masonry. Uh, so if you're ever interested, check us out. Come by and say hey. Uh, but yeah, we're in Natchitoches, Louisiana, so uh, not far from Natchitoches, Texas. Um, all right, so we're here to talk about cemeteries, my favorite subject of all time. Uh, it's actually how I got into preservation, uh, what I was most interested in. I have been since I was a little kid. So why do we preserve cemeteries? So we don't do it for now. Uh, we don't do it for the next generation, but the next and the next. A lot of the monuments that we're going to look at and we work on are, you know, 1850s, you know, 1800s, 1900s. We don't want to do anything now that will lessen the impact, uh, lessen the, the time period for that. You know, they've been doing fine for 100, 150 years before, maybe 200 years before something starts to happen. We want to make sure that what we're not doing in the immediate future isn't going to shorten the life of that. So, how many are genealogists here? I know this crowd. That's it? No one else is in genealogy? I have a hard time believing that. Yeah, okay, there you go. So, genealogy is the fastest growing pastime in America. If anybody looked 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, at Roots Web or Find a Grave or any of those, you would know how much this grows exponentially. I got my mother interested in genealogy, and she was calling me constantly. Oh, they just updated the census for you know this year and that year. Things are getting dropped on the internet as we speak exponentially. This is the reason that cemetery preservation has taken off. Um, when I first started doing this, so I've been with the Park Service 13 years now, so I've been doing cemetery work for about 20 years. When I first started, every once in a while you get a call, and now I get. Um, I, Kath and I were talking about it earlier, I'm booking my 2020 calendar. And it's all genealogy driven. It's, it's groups, it's clubs, it's, uh, you know, conferences, all about wanting to go out and find these graves. I was always t already talking to someone who, you know, talking about, uh, we're doing a project, we're trying to find this person, that person. And what happens is people who are doing this go out and they find a cemetery and then they start thinking, you know, this really needs some work. This isn't the way I thought it was going to look. Or, you know, I found this headstone. I get this call all the time. It's in horrible shape. What do I do? So we're not really necessarily caring for our own families. We're caring for just the cemeteries in general that, that we go to for whatever reason has brought us there. Um, and most of these people that are doing the work, you know, I care for, I've worked on cemeteries all over the country. And I think I've only worked on two that I was actually related to. So in the past, how many here have been to a family reunion that was at a cemetery? At one time, that was where we did it. The reason, you had more people there in the ground than you did out of the ground, so let's go visit them. And when we did that, we cared for the cemetery people, did cleanup days. Um, you know, that was a, an annual reoccurring thing. 
And we don't really do that anymore. So that's one of the reasons that perfect strangers and distant relatives are starting to take on and care for cemeteries. One of the reasons people get interested in cemeteries is the creative and artistic value. That's how I got into it. That is your city sculpture garden. You know, everyone's talking about, we, don't, we talk about the genealogy, genealogical information and you know, when people were buried and, and how they lived and when they died, but oftentimes we miss the fact that these are sculptures. These are incredible sculptures that are out in public that we can go visit and appreciate, and we sort of overlook that. As a, con as a conservator, that's why I got interested in cemeteries. Also, it's a tangible link to a historical event. Cemeteries are a great thing to bring kids out with and to bring school groups out. History has become sort of an abstract thing. I don't know how many follow current teaching uh, methodology, but we don't teach uh, chronological order anymore. So we're, we don't start with early American history and go through um, they skip around. One year is the Civil War, the next year might be settlers, the next year might be World War II. So history has become sort of this abstract thing. And I think a lot of kids that I, I've worked with have a hard time seeing the linear connection of history. Um, how many watch like The Tonight Show and stuff and they, they'll go to college campuses and ask, you know, when was the Civil War? And they'll go, well, that was with Vietnam, right? And everyone laughs. It's not really funny. The reason is because it's not linear. It's become very abstract. Taking them out to the cemetery and saying, here is the person who did this thing. Here are the people. I was just talking to someone earlier. War of 1812. You're lucky if kids have even heard of the War of 1812. But going out and saying, here are the survivors. Here are people who actually fought in the War of 1812 and telling their story. Um, for myself, one of my, my biggest aha moments, um, I led, uh, two years ago, I led a project in Chalmette National Cemetery. Uh, anybody ever been? Uh, Chalmette, it was the Battle of War of 1812, uh, the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, it's right outside of, of New Orleans proper. That is where um, now there's a large uh, government cemetery. So I'm out there with a group of students. We ran a project where we had volunteer groups. We cleaned 14,000 headstones in a month. We brought all volunteer effort, all mostly high school kids coming to do service learning. Uh, so I was actually with a group, an all-girls school from San Diego, California. And very fun-loving group. They had uh, one of the little Bluetooth speakers on a suction cup. They put on their backpack sprayer, so they're out there scrubbing headstones, and they're all singing along and dancing to this little head, this little speaker. And Bob Marley's song "Buffalo Soldier" came on. You guys familiar with the song? And I said, "Oh my gosh, this is amazing! You guys know what a buffalo soldier is, right?" And they all knew the lyrics, and not one in the group of 60 kids actually knew what a buffalo soldier was. And I said, "Everyone, stop! You are literally standing in a field of buffalo soldiers." the largest group of U.S. colored troops buried in the cemeteries in Chalmette, thousands of them. I said, there, here are, let's talk about this for a minute. Here's, and I, you had kids crying, kids were all, all of a sudden everybody's phones out, they're taking pictures, they're like, I'm, I can't wait to get home and tell my teacher about this. And th so these, these guys were actual soldiers. Like, yes, before that, they were just doing a service project. They had no, no connection to why they, all these people were buried there and what they did. So it's having that actual story. These are tangible links. They're not abstract anymore. This is the person. Um, oh, Lyons Wakeman. Uh, this is also in Chalmette. Uh, Lyons Wakeman's really uh, Sarah Wakeman. There's uh, a woman, she cut her hair off, uh, wrapped herself and fought through the almost the entire Civil War before she was killed in battle, and then it was discovered she was a woman. Uh, I love that she made up the name Lyons. Um, but her brothers went to war, and she didn't understand why she couldn't, so she did. So one of the things that we talk about first before we really sort of do any formal preservation is documentation. And this is super easy to do, super simple. Um, this is what most grant agencies want to see that you've already done. 
Uh, if you want to go try to get on the National Register, they want to ask you, well, have you done documentation? Have you documented your cemetery? Most places want to know that you've already made this sort of good faith effort to put work into the cemetery before um, other things happen. So like I said, most grant agencies and things like that ask first for documentation. So there's lots of different types of documentation. And our, our geologists, uh, I'm sure, are familiar with most of this. So one of the first things that we think about before we even start to do uh, the tangible, you know, what headstones we have, who's on them, is looking for primary sources. Are there historic photographs out there? And a lot of times people go, no, no, no one would have taken photographs out here. Be creative and you're looking. You know, just because we can't Google it and go, nope, can't find anything, doesn't mean they're not out there. So I asked earlier how many have been to reunions at cemeteries, and several of you, that was very common. So one thing you start to ask for is old family photographs. Took pi pictures at, at cemeteries. Another thing, I've worked with several churches and I've asked that who have graveyards attached to them and say, do you have historic photographs? And they go, no, we don't. You go, all right, who here has old wedding photographs? And it's amazing how many times you do the wedding party right by the steps of the church and guess what's in the background? The cemetery. I was doing work one time uh, in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And we're doing a cleanup day, same thing we'll be doing tomorrow. We're out there, we're cleaning headstones. And a gentleman walks across the street and he comes and he thanks us and says, well, I grew up in that house. He was in his 70s. He said, I grew up in that house and I've lived here my whole life. You know, I've seen the cemetery change and he talks to us a little bit and he thanks us and he leaves. A few minutes later he comes back and goes, I want to show you guys a photograph. And he's got a photograph of him as a small child on a bicycle. His parents aren't photographing the cemetery, but they're photographing their son on his bicycle, all smiling his brand new bicycle. And what's behind him is the cemetery. So he walks us over to his driveway and he says, this is where the bike is, let's look. We turn around and we look. In the current cemetery we're working is about five headstones. In his photograph, there's about 30. We have no idea where they went. And he said he doesn't know either. He went off to Vietnam. He didn't come home until he retired. He came home. He said, so in that time period, somewhere in the 70s and 80s, they lost about half the headstones in that cemetery, and no one can tell us why. So things change. When we asked, are there historic photographs? No. Sure there are. People across the street got the cemetery in their view. So be creative when you start asking around and looking for photographs. Also, uh, Victorian era, cemeteries were a big tourist attraction. So if you have larger cemeteries like this, for example, this is Colonial Park in Savannah, they made postcards, stereo cards. Really big cemeteries even had travel books and little uh, pamphlets that they would give out. Oral interviews. So we don't really think about oral interviews with things like cemeteries, but they can be really important. Uh, this is Miss Bertha Lee. She's in her, I just found out she is still alive. I did interviews with her 10 years ago. She was in her late 80s then. I found out just the other day that she's almost 100 now and is still a uh, great memory and wants to do some more interviews. We walked around the cemetery with her and she could tell us every unmarked grave who they were, how they were related to other people. In that cemetery, we had uh, field stones. Now, I study cemeteries, it's what I do. I think to myself, oh, well, field stones, that must be a very old grave. And, you know, and she explains, no, that's her uncle. That same stone, each time someone in the family passes away, they roll the same stone to the new grave. And at the funeral, they take a collection and put a headstone on the grave prior to that. So this stone, she's 100. Her parents had been doing it before she was born. To their, we're, all, we're talking almost 200 years they've been rolling the same stone around. Now her daughter who was with us had never heard any of these stories. So when, had we not done that, when Miss Bertha died, that would have been the end of that. But once she said it, you can actually see the grass hasn't even completed to grow back there. So why do we care about documentation? So we talked about its account of the current condition. So we want to know what the cemetery looks like, um, what kind of 
work it needs. A record of existing materials. So one of the things that we combat constantly is vandalism and theft, especially theft. If you don't have record of what you have, you can't really get it back once it's gone. I've worked with several cemeteries who have said, well, we, all these, thi you know, these things got stolen, fences and gates and uh, urns, and go, well, what did it look like? I don't know, it was about this big and it was bronze. It's kind of like going to the police and say, my car got stolen. What is it? I don't know. It was a car. It had four wheels. You're not going to get it back. It's the same thing. Um, I was working in a cemetery. They had this very large pile of gates. And I asked, I said, what, you know, what's the deal with this? And they explained to me that um, there's a big coffee book called the uh, Cemeteries of the South, big coffee table book, black and white photography. Uh, see, it would have been sometime in the late 90s, early to about 2000. Couple was caught in a rider truck with that book on the front seat. They had decided to basically that was a, looked like a great shopping catalog. They had driven from New York State down all the way to New Orleans, down through Savannah, Charleston, um, down to Florida, and had robbed all of these cemeteries along the way. They had the entire rider truck full, statuary, fencing, gates, all this. When they were caught, they lessened their sentence by promising to return where they belong. They set all these gates in the cemetery. The cemetery got them back. The cemetery had no idea where they went because they had never gone out to take pictures and document where their fences were or what was out there. It also helps you to establish preservation priorities. So what do you need? A lot of times you don't really know what you need until you go out and start looking. All right, so doing documentation on forms. There's forms all over the internet. Don't make up your own. I don't really think it's that important. They're all over the place. Uh, I couldn't find that Oklahoma has one, but a lot of states have their own. Um, I got some sites in here. One thing we're playing with right now is doing them on uh, Google Forms. And then everyone's got a cell phone, so you can actually all together update it and add to it at the same time. So if you're going to do written documentation, uh, either handwritten out or electronically, pick your form, decide that's what you're going to do. Train all your people. And this is something that's great with volunteers. Um, here, I'll leave that up while. This is something that's easy to do with volunteers. And there's always volunteers looking to do stuff. Most universities, their fraternities and sororities now, have to do so many service hours to keep their charter. There's an office at the university, go ask, hey, do you guys have, here's my card. If they're looking for service hours, tell them to call me. 80% of all Boy Scout, Eagle Scout projects involve a cemetery. Girl Scouts, I've done lots of work. I have a Girl Scout troop, I'm a Girl Scout leader. So is my wife, she has the younger ones, I have the older ones, I have four daughters. So thus, I became a Girl Scout leader. Um, my Girl Scout troop currently is documenting, cleaning an entire cemetery, mapping the cemetery, and putting it all online and to find a grave and billion graves because no one had ever done it. It's an abandoned cemetery back in the woods. Um, my troop of uh, the time, they were all 10-year-olds, uh, did a full uh, tourism guide to one of the cemeteries. They mapped it. They met with a GPS e uh, expert, a GIS expert. It's amazing how much the kids can do. Lots of people are looking for volunteer work. Uh, I've worked with uh, National Guard, uh, tons and tons of groups. But one of the important things is, and more, more surveys, like I said, there are a lot of them out there. Um, One of the important things is, if you're going to do it, though, is to train everybody. Um, I've seen the negative results of not doing that. I worked at a cemetery one time where they hired AmeriCorps, and this is nothing negative against AmeriCorps, great organization. But they hired a group of students for the summer, paid kids. They come out, they gave them all clipboards and pens and said, go transcribe the cemetery, and gave them no training. Didn't tell them anything about and just assumed that they would know what headstones were and what footstones were. And guess what? They didn't. 
So they spent all the money and they worked for an entire summer. They handed us the paperwork and said, here, we've, and it was garbage, absolute garbage. Wasn't worth the trees that they fell to make the paper because they didn't tell the, peop the kids anything about it. So they had no idea what anything was. So, easy way to involve the, the community. So how would people, how would different people, no, how would people describe this differently, whoops. Um, so training, do something as simple as this. Buy some donuts, bring everybody in. Could be a PowerPoint, it could be walking around the cemetery and explaining what a headstone is. Now we all know that, and that seems really simplistic, right? Doesn't mean, I, I get questions all the time, the difference between a headstone and a footstone. I get people who email me that, who are trying to do research, and you think, oh, okay, let me you know, explain that to you. So just because we understand it and we know it, because we're going out to the cemeteries, doesn't mean that everyone does. So doing something as simple as making a little PowerPoint or walking around and explaining, this is a headstone, it's ground supported, this is just being held up by the earth. Sorry, I thought I had turned off. <laughs> oh, it's fine, it doesn't bother me. Um, headstone on stack bases. What a ledger is. I get all the time that these are fallen headstones. Nope, that's a big ledger that was made to be on the ground, always will, always supposed to be. So it just explaining to people what that is, giving them a little going line by line and explaining what everything on your form is. Giving them that training is all they need. And then voila, you got a volunteer group that can go out and do it. One of the most important things uh, people overlook, because they're not a headstone, so, I mean, why do we care? Funeral home plaques, really important. Funeral home plaques were never meant to be a permanent marker. They're meant to be put out by the funeral home so that the monument company can come out and figure out, ah, yes, this is Aunt Mabel. This is where we're putting the headstone. Got it. Then they you generally remove that. When they get a big pile, they take them back to the funeral home. Here you go, reuse them. And they're reused. However, we don't always have the money, or maybe Aunt Mabel was the last person in the family, so no one puts up a headstone. This becomes her permanent marker. You can see her husband, Herman, here. That's been there since 1967. That is his marker now. All it's going to take is a weed eater to hit that, a mower to hit that, and voila, we don't know where Herman is anymore. So documenting these become really important. This is a really old style. Um, marker that was written on with a china pen and of course there's nothing left on it this is just a porcelain plaque we know somebody's there we don't know who anymore but we know that marks a body so figuring out the materials um, wooden markers versus marble granite <clears throat> this is something easy to teach people but it matters a lot as a preservationist because how we treat one material is very different than how we treat another one. So learning the right way to do transcriptions. And this is one style, it's the way I like, um, where you have your backslash denotes in the next line. And if it has mistakes, put those in. Because those mistakes make up the historic character of that marker. That marker now, you know, that's part of its history. So we don't want to just sort of, oh, well, obviously they made that wrong. If something misspelled, leave it misspelled. Don't correct it. That's part of its history. I don't speak Cherokee. I can't write Cherokee. Can't read Cherokee. Um, but a lot of the headstones where we're working tomorrow are in Cherokee. This is someone we would want to bring in someone who can to teach us or say, okay, here, who here in our volunteer group can write Cherokee? We want you only to work in this area. Because how I would try, and, I would be af afraid to transcribe these because, you know, you get it wrong and it has a different meaning. The letter's wrong. So it would be a very important, uh, where I live in Louisiana, we have a lot of markers in French. 
sure, I can write that down, but I don't know what it means. I would want to say, okay, who here speaks French? I would like you to make sure you do those in case things are misspelled. You would know it. Uh, you would know, especially the handwritten ones, if they're correct or what they say. Iconography on the stones, uh, very important. It tells us a little bit about that person, how they lived, who they were. Um, so make note of those. That's a really good resource if you haven't. It's a little field guide for iconography. All right, so mapping. There's tons of programs available, free programs, uh, programs you can buy. It can be as complex as you want it or as simple as you want it. Um, so this is a site map that we did. This is online. This is all done uh, with a robotic total station that comes out and lays a 3D grid. So these are sub-centimeter accuracy. Um, you now can go on ArcGIS. You can click on that. It will bring up the transcriptions, the photographs. You can make it as complex as that. Or uh, I worked with a cemetery one time that was about, about two acres, uh, Star Cemetery. And they had a fence around their cemetery, and they wanted to map it. And they were doing this completely with volunteer work. So I don't know who came up with this. It's brilliant. I've told people all over the country about this, and I hope lots of people are doing it now. But I can't take credit for it. They took Dixie cups, the uh, solo cups, and they went along the fence. And every 10 feet, they did a giant letter on one fence. And on the next fence, they did giant numbers, just pushed into the chain link fence. And then they took surveyor's tape and they laid out a 10-foot grid over the whole cemetery. So when you came in, hi, you're A1, here's your clipboard. You're you know, E3, here's your clipboard. And now you had a 10-foot square place to draw and document. That's it. That becomes very manageable. Oh, 10 square feet, that's not very much. I can do that. So now your job is just to transcribe, photograph, and sketch out your 10 feet. And then they had a volunteer that put it all back together. So they did a super accurate map, hand drawn, of a two acre cemetery. So, about the same size of the cemetery we're going to work at tomorrow, one way to map the whole site. Didn't ha doesn't have to be this, so it can be as complex as you want or very simplistic. Still does the same thing. So, photo documentation. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Take lots of pictures. We all have digital cameras now. We all have them in our pockets. Um, heck, they're all geo-referenced now if you're using your phone and things like that. So go out and photograph, you know, what the headstone says overall, all about it. One of my big soapbox issues is when people go out and do documentation, so let's say you're photographing, you're transcribing, Please share that when you're done. Please give that to someone else. Um, I've worked with lots of groups and they go, well, we did all the work, it's ours. And that's it. They don't want to share it. They don't want to go to your local library. They, I bet they have a genealogical room. Give it to them. Give them a copy. Put it online. Print it out. Um, electronic isn't archival. So storing it on a flash drive or, or a CD or a DVD, that's not archival. We have no idea how long those are going to last. Actually, now archivists tell us, um, I know we have archivists, most of my archivist friends say uh, 10 years is about the average life of a CD or a DVD. Flash drives even less. So storing everything, stacking those up and storing them isn't safe. Putting them out there, printing them, handing copies out, Get them, get it out there. Uh, I've worked with multiple groups over the years who have confessed to me that they've um, done everything, kept it electronically, and then lost it. One of the things you can do now is you can up upload your transcriptions and photographs on Find a Grave and Billion Graves and all those. Uh, I just worked at a cemetery outside of Fort Polk, Louisiana, that was in Leesville that was heavily vandalized. Um, Two young men, for whatever reason, came in. There's about 25 headstones in the cemetery that destroyed 22 of those. No reason. Thought it would be interesting. They came in, and there was a, a marker in the front of the cemetery for 
uh, a historic site that had once they picked that up and they threw it through the first headstone. They picked up the pieces of those headstones. They picked those up and they threw them through the other headstones. So when they were done, like I said, uh, 22 of the 25 were down. And what happened was because they were taking these chunks and literally throwing them through, we now had a mix of marble that spanned a site about as big as this room. So if you like jigsaw puzzles, we would have loved to have had you at this site. So we had to figure out not only what everything went together, where they went. Because they pulled up the whole headstones to throw them. These were all very small. Most of them were children's markers. They had no documentation. We're working with the, count, the parish preservation office. They had never documented it. We had no pictures. Hold on, while we're here, let me look up. I have the Find a Grave app. Someone had posted photographs of the whole cemetery. We now had, we don't know who the person is. No one there had a copy of it, but we had it on Find a Grave. So we were actually able to piece all the headstones back together from the pictures that someone had posted on the internet. The only problem with the po pictures they posted were very similar to these. I have no spatial data. So we, some of them we still have no idea where in the cemetery they went because all we had was the close-ups. So they're actually going to try to find that person that submitted them and find out if they had any other photographs, maybe. So in photo documentation, there's a lot of uh, genealogical websites out there that do recommendations for ways to photograph. A lot of those are wrong and, and actually harmful to the headstones. So we don't use shaving cream or flour or chalk. Here's an example of, of oh, I missed spelling. That's embarrassing. Um, so here's an example of, of, yeah, we don't use caulk either. Um, here's an example of shaving cream. People spray it on and squeeze it off, and it leaves all the letters highlighted, and then they take a photograph. The problem is this is what you get. Because what you've just done is you just covered the headstone with aloe, tantalin, fats, oils, all of those soak in and absorb into the headstone. Every time the wind blows, even if you rinse it off, trust me, it got absorbed into there. So every time the wind blows, all the microorganisms in the air are going to stick to that, and you're going to have this bright green biological growth in about two weeks. And then that's going to take a lot of effort to get off. So what you do is I go into cemeteries and I find these. Just where the epitaph information has biological growth and nothing else. It's where someone's used shaving cream. So you can do a lot of stuff with just reflection of light. Um, you know, these are just using the big photo reflectors. Um, the one I have I carry with me is made to go in a car window, it costs just a few dollars, they fold up. Um, how many have ever watched like one of the model shoots on TV? That's, you stand, you've got some unpaid intern standing there doing this in front of the model. That's, they're changing the, the way the light hits them. So that's why with, even with the sun behind them, their face is all lit up because someone's standing there with a big reflector. It's the same thing. Um, and you can do it on, by, if you're by yourself. I usually take the reflector and kind of find, yep, that's the good, lay it down. Go set the timer on my tripod, go back, hold it in place, take the picture. Um, so I'm usually in the cemetery working by myself. Same. So in documentation, mention, um, I'm a big fan of color on headstones. Uh, at one time, it was a lot more popular. We saw it a lot more. As that paint fades out, um, UV degrades it. We lose that, and then you get headstones that have no epitaph on them anymore. Um, and a lot of people will call me and go, oh, they did all this work in the cemetery, but they never marked a single grave. It was really weird. Well, they did. They were just painted at one point. So this isn't inscribed. This is totally painted on for whatever reason. So if we come back to a cleanup day every year, then you just touch that paint up. If we stop coming back to do cleanup days after just a few years, that paint fades, it's gone, and now we have an unknown grave. <coughs> so if you're doing documentation and it's painted on, make note, this is a painted epitaph. The information's painted on so that in future generations, if someone comes back and says, 
we think this might be, but it said Evelyn Bradley on the form. We can't find Evelyn Bradley. Oh, wait, it was painted. Here's one with no paint on it. So another thing, if you're taking on an abandoned cemetery, which a lot of times that's the best time, um, a lot of plants will come back that were planted that we, we keep them so well manicured now, uh, we lose those. So plants were often used as grave markers. Um, a lot of early settling, settlers, you know, you're just trying to make sure you can survive the winter. You're not thinking about putting up a really nice marker. So plants were used. Um, a lot of people heading west and things like that, all right, let's just put a plant there. We're good. If we keep, um, a lot of times the cemeteries are so well mowed now and things like that, we lose these. Um, I'm not a plant person. I don't, I can barely keep my own yard mode. Um, it's not really my thing. So this is where I have to bring in someone who does know. So for example, we worked at a cemetery and had these really scraggly little thorn, um, just these ugly little sprouts all over the cemetery. I would totally mow that down myself. We came back in the springtime and these were all tea roses, rows and rows of them. And once we came back, we realized they were all about this wide and anywhere from two to six feet long. They're bodies. These were what were marking graves all over the field. We had no idea. This is an example of one just because it still had the funeral home plaque there. Otherwise, we've never seen all of these bodies laid out. So unconventional grave markers. Um, lots, we're going to see a lots of little field stones tomorrow. Uh, swept graves, I don't know if you have that as far as Oklahoma. We have them all over the, uh, the deep south. So that's just a mounded grave that gets swept every year. Well, it doesn't take long to lose that. Um, doing oral interviews, this is a axle off of a Ford tractor. Uh, we were doing an oral interview and the family said, no, we put that there on purpose, we got it out of daddy's shed. That is literally, that was the grave marker. And they said that was all, they all knew what it was. So what, you know, what, that was fine. That was good enough for them. <clears throat> grave goods, uh, other things, um, soldiers, markers, things like that. We talked a little bit about this. So trying to figure out next step of documentation. Who are they? All right, and this, I'll go over this kind of quickly and hope a lot of you can make it tomorrow. This is what we're going to be doing. Um, this is what most people are very interested in, is doing the cemetery care itself. So one of the first things we ask is, why are we cleaning it? Uh, that sounds kind of silly, but that's very important. Why we're cleaning it depends on how we clean it. And most of the time, it's for this. It's for readability. Genealogists want to clean the headstone so they can read it, so they can document it. The most important thing is that we want to wash, we want to clean the entire headstone, not just the genealogical information, which I see all the time. Um, I'll go out to the cemetery and there'll just be a clean square right over. Sometimes you can tell they were only interested in maybe the death date, so there'll just be a clean square right over the death date and that's it. You know, just general soiling, a lot of times just dirt and things that they get, they get splashed up. A lot of times we can do that with a soft bristle brush and water and that's all we need. Most of the time what we're cleaning is biological growth. Um, and the cleaner, we're going to be using a cleaner called D2, which is specifically designed to kill biological growth. And a lot of times, depends on the staining, but a lot of times you'll see um, this one had, used to have a big anchor that someone stole, but this is copper staining. This is rust staining. Uh, there were two iron pins at this, which is very common. That's what held a lot of the headstones together. Uh, unfortunately, as the iron ages, it corrodes, it expands, it breaks the stone apart. We have to take them out. Um, but a lot of times when you have rust staining or copper staining, we, I, you can't just remove that with anything off the shelf. You're going to have to call a professional in. but. With those two, um, they're not going to harm the stone. They're, they're in it. Um, you can just leave it or get a professional. But nothing, nothing that you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot or any of that and buy will take it off unless it just eats through the stone itself. 
Um, a lot of times we have people will call them, we have what's called sugaring. And this is where when you touch the stone, it just sort of comes off in like sugar. That's usually due to bad cleaning practices in the past. I'll mention that in a second. Vandalism. Um, one of my big soapbox issues is a lot of times vandalism is uh, politically or racially motivated. I'm not a big fan of calling the local news station and getting everyone involved. The reason is uh, we know for a fact that you get copycats from that. So if your cemetery gets vandalized for whatever reason, and I mean, if it's someone just marking their territory, that's one thing. That's what this is, just someone showing off. Um, you know, tagging that. Okay, that's one thing. Definitely call the police, get them involved, but call the local news station, especially if it's politically or racially motivated. Um, you've now given that one act, you know, uh, legs to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, how many remember well, last year there was a big uh, cemetery vandalism in Baltimore? Uh, Jewish cemetery, they knocked over hundreds of headstones. Okay. There were two other cemeteries were hit two days later. And we know for a fact because the people saw it on TV and went, hey, the whole country has seen this. I can do that too. So they went out and did it as well. So definitely call the police. But if it's, if graffiti is not as simple to remove as I wish it was, um, call a professional in, feel free to call me. I can give you some tips, but what works one day not, not work the next because the, there's so many variables on paint. Uh, I, I won't get into it. Um, I could do a whole hour talk on, on that. Um, but for me, I wrap it up, put a tarp around it, say you're doing preservation work, uh, put some plywood up against it, you know, mark it as, oh, we're doing uh, preservation work and then uh, go on. How many here know that uh, the, cap the White House was tagged a few years ago? It was. Never hit the news. They put up scaffolding and wrapped it within about two hours and started working on it. We didn't want anyone to know that. Um, it was right where, well, I won't tell you where it was. Anyway. Um, so, when you're choosing cleaning methods, does it accelerate deterioration? Do you have loss of original materials? What's the long-term stability of the monument after being cleaned? What's the effects of the cleaner? These are really important questions. If you don't know, ask somebody. Call me, email me, I'll talk to you about it. If we don't know, I I'm, would be afraid to use it. So acceptable is low pressure washing. So anything more than about 300 PSI, PSI is pounds per square inch, it's how hard the water comes out. Anything more than about 300 will damage marble and limestone. Um, if you have a newer house, um, your hose is coming out at about 150 PSI. If you have an old house like mine, it's probably less now because the, water, the pipes are getting corroded. Most pressure washers that that you can buy are 3,000 PSI. I can carve marble at 3,000 PSI. So we definitely don't want to use those. Um, what we'll look at tomorrow is a lot of um, the local field stone. That will, it has real thin sheets that will blow those sheets off and all your writing will come off with it. So we never use power equipment. Never wire brushes, never nylock brushes. I don't care what you read on the internet. Um, this is all over the place. There's tons of videos of people showing you how to do this. The only reason this works is it takes the entire top layer of the stone off. That's how it cleans, period. Um, we don't want to do that. Um, like I said, you can go on YouTube, on Roots Web, and there's tons of videos of people showing you how in just a few seconds, you can take an angle grinder with a brush and clean the headstone just as white as the day it was carved. It's true. It does do that because you've completely taken the top layer of stone away. So you've just done probably 200 years worth of, of wear in 30 seconds. Same thing, the pr high pressure washing. 
Um, this was a well-meaning genealogist who needed the birth date, obviously. Um, they did not do that when I took this picture. It had been done about two years prior. It wears at a different rate because it is etched in. All those wand marks are actually carved in. Bleach is really bad. Um, I know that's something people have used for a long time. If you want to do this experiment, it's really easy. Pour a little bit of bleach in a clear glass bowl or dish. Leave it in the windowsill. All the moisture will evaporate out, and what you leave behind are chlorine crystals. You'll grow these really pretty little crystals. That's what happens inside the stone. That's what causes sugaring. That's what causes this delamination. It will actually tear the stone apart from the inside. So not a big fan of bleach. Uh, not a fan of acid either. Um, acid only works because it literally eats the stone away. So the biggest th thing to take from this, do no harm and exercise patience. Um, you know, it didn't get clean in 10 minutes. I mean, it didn't get dirty in 10 minutes. It's going to take a little while. So soft bristle brushes, natural or nylon, that's it. Kind of went over all that. And this is what we're going to do tomorrow. So hopefully you can come out. But if not, I um, thought we'd mention it. So you got to get the stone wet, clean from the bottom up, lots of water. All right, so we have no water we're working tomorrow. So what do we do about that? There's lots of solutions for having no water. Um, I'll leave that up while I'm talking. So you can bring water in, um, trash cans, 55 gallon drums. A lot of times the fire department or the National Guard uh, have, ag, uh, have what are called water buffaloes. They're water tanks on wheels. Ask them to borrow them while you're having a cleanup day. Bring them out. Um, a lot of farmers have ag tanks on trailers. Just make sure water's all that's been in it. Um, I did a cleaning day one time, and a farmer said they'd bring an ag tank, and they brought it out. We poured the water out, and it was bright yellow. And I said, what's been in your tank? Oh, just fertilizers. OK, we can't use this tank. So make sure the tank's only been used for water, if that's what you're going to use. But there's tons of ways to bring water out. Uh, I usually use a, either a backpack sprayer with a little pump sprayer, fill those with water, keep them in my trunk. Um, me personally, uh, in my pickup, I use uh, the really cheap plastic trash cans. I fill them up, I put the lid down, I strap the lid down, I drive out to the cemetery and work right out. I just drill a hole in the bottom of the, of the trash can and thread on a plastic uh, hose bib. And then you could actually run it, as long as the truck's higher than you are, you could actually spray with a water hose right out of them. And when they get empty, you just lay them down and, and use the next one. Um, so lots of solutions for that. I did a training one time in Arkansas. There was no water on the site. The forestry department gave us all these uh, bladder backpack sprayers. And they actually had juvenile delinquents that ran a bucket chain all day long to fill our backpack sprayers. Um, and it was pretty far. There was about probably 40 kids, and it was, it was a very far distance to a public park where they were getting the water from. So each kid had to walk probably twice the length of this room with a bucket to the next kid. And at one point, we'd been cleaning for a while. I told, they had a sheriff's deputy there watching them. I said, I think, we've, I think they've cleaned enough. Um, I, I think you should let them rest. And he smiled at me, and he kicked the bucket over of water, and he said, they can do this all day. It's like, OK. <laughs> um, you guys have a cemetery workshop coming up here in Tahlequah. I don't know if anybody knows about this. Um, you can go to the Cherokee Nation dot com, uh, but that's in what two weekends, I think. Um, Jonathan Appel is teaching the class. He's a really good instructor. Uh, if you're really interested in this, I highly recommend uh, recommend that. Um, I think it w was it forty some dollars. I think it's like forty five or fifty. Yeah, um, but yeah, definitely recommend it. Uh, John's a good instructor. Um, and his is a lot more. Um, well, I mean. Yeah, and he, it's. He, he, which I, I know you do this as well. We decided not to put everybody to work like this. Jonathan is in their room sometimes, but he brings out the tripod and just moves like these big monuments. Yeah. Around at the cemetery. So his is definitely for people who are going to be doing more work. Um, 
but yeah, if you're really into it, I def definitely recommend it. This is me. Questions? I'm exactly at one hour. There you go. Have you ever been to the cemetery at Mayfield, Kentucky? Of nope. Course it's got full life-size uh, figures in the family's uh, Oh, um, yes. One's on horseback, one, two are in a wagon. Yes, I've not been there. Um, it's totally cool. Yeah, some friends of mine uh, rest, uh, restored it after the tor uh, tornado a few years ago. That, that, they were completely wiped out. Um, I saw the literally buckets of parts, ears and hands. Yeah, but there. I was there before that happened. So yeah, this would have been, it, they would have been wiped out in two, three, 2012, I think. It was. Yeah, I think it was 2010 that I remember. Yeah, but now they look just like they did before. They spend about a year putting them all back together. And well, there's a lot of photographs online. I mean, a yes. Lot of I've not been there myself, but yes. Abandoned cemeteries, but not really used anymore cemeteries. These old family cemeteries is now on someone's private property. How do you get access to those without having to call and beg? Society, it's. Fact sheet number nine, and it actually has all the, uh, that's what it's about. And uh, they have a website that tells you how to gain access and what your rights and, and regulations are. And So one of the things I didn't mention but it's very important is, um, do you have permission to work there? And, and, you know, there's really no good Samaritan law for cemetery care. Um, you need to make sure that it, it's really okay for you to be there. Um, we all are interested in cemeteries, um, but I've, I've, wor I've run across lots of people in the past who were not interested in you cleaning headstones or even going out there at all. Um, you know, no preservation work, let them degrade, let them uh, disintegrate, that was okay with them. Uh, so make sure that you have permission um, for that. But yeah, this is a really good uh, resource for Oklahoma. So it actually, y yes and no. So yes, every state's different, but also every cemetery is a little different. So who has the rights that cemetery depends on the cemetery itself. So a lot of larger cemeteries you bought, the original people bought that plot of land. There are rules and regulations with that deed um, and that I've worked in cemeteries where they came through and demolished things and they said, whoa, we're, we're just letting you use that space. Your original deed says we have the ultimate power over that, um, that site forever. So it really depends on, um, I get called in for a lot of people who, who want to have lawsuits and things like that. And it really depends on the site as well. So older, like family cemetery and stuff, there was no rules or regulations. So it goes back to the state laws. You know, can you move it? You know, who owns it? Things like that. Um, some states have a rule where you have to run an ad for 30 days in a public space, uh, and if no one objects, then you can remove the cemetery. Um, I know I did a lot of work uh, with the state of Kentucky. They have a a pretty horrible rule that if they can't prove anyone has interacted with the cemetery, I forgot the years, but it's not very long then it's considered abandoned and can be demolished. It's a sort of a loophole for mining companies to come in. So they consider, if you take a single picture and post it on the internet to like find a grave, they consider it no longer abandoned. A series of workshops for them and the biggest thing was to tell people, please, when you're taking pictures, post them online, send them to the state so that the state can, can stamp that from this day it's not been abandoned. So now we have another, I think it's like 20 years, it's not very long. So we have another 20 years that no one can touch the cemetery. Uh, and they actually showed us one cemetery that was, it was something like I have a science fiction movie, huge pit mine, but you had this spire in the middle that went up to the cemetery with a little trail that came off of it. And everything else for acres around it was gone. And I mean like 200 feet down gone. Because someone had posted online that pictures of that cemetery so it wasn't abandoned. So they couldn't remove it. But they could remove everything else around it. Um, so yeah, it, it, the the rules and regulations change where from the state and the cemetery itself. But um, like I said, that's a really good fact sheet. That's all about the state laws and the regulations and stuff. Other questions? Yes. I feel 
going to the cemetery over at Proctor that where I think my great grandparents are buried, and I know her sister is and family. And uh, anyway, uh, different. The neighbors said they owned this property and wouldn't allow me in there when I wanted to go. It was it was right on the highway. Well, it still is. But anyway, I had to go around the road nearly a mile and through this man's pasture, zigzag down through there. And anyway, I'd mow a little and rake a whole bunch and rake, mow a little and rake a whole bunch with the push mower. Anyway, then he put the gate up down there where I couldn't get into it. So that's when I put legs onto what I was doing and I went to the courthouse and found out that he didn't own the cemetery at all. Mm -hmm. And in 1914, uh, all the supposed to, all the cemeteries were turned over to the counties, and but this one wasn't. It still it still belongs to the Cherokee Nation. But anyway, uh, the man that lived next door uh, had uh, he had a ravine, a gully there that he needed to fill in. So he took the large headstones and put them in that gully and covered them up with tape. And it would take a uh, court order and a lot of muscle that I don't have to retrieve those headstones. But we did set up right what we could find and, and then had the grave locator come in and mark the grave sites. And it's my understanding in Oklahoma that if, because I went through this with a, an abandoned family cemetery at South Corner, which was the former family cemetery that had been bulldozed. And I was going out there trying to retrieve the headstones that were at the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want me on the land. It was across, um, they just had cows out, out, out there. But um, I actually went to the sheriff and they, he went and told them they had to allow me access um, to, that, to that cemetery. So it's my understanding in Oklahoma that there has to be provided an access to right. um, cemeteries. So we later uh, got the place surveyed and put a gate up at the highway so we don't have to cross that man's property. And it's against the law to, to bulldoze in here. I mean, I don't know when those laws went into effect. This was done in the 1970s, I think. But, um, I mean, nowadays you can get into a lot of trouble here. Yeah, most states the rule is if you have reason to be in that cemetery. So, you know, me driving down the road and just being a tourist, that's not good enough reason. But if you're related or doing official work, um, most states, you ha they have to gain you access to the cemetery by law, even if it goes across your property. Does that apply to uh, cemeteries that are uh, unmarked or unregistered with the state? A lot of family cemeteries. The old ones back in the hills where I'm from, the city of Tulsa has purchased all the area around Lake Gucci, where I'm from, and there's uh, two cemeteries that we know of. Uh, Mark all in Cherokee, just marked with stones. But the city of Tulsa owns all the land. It but might it's, be. But it's it not registered with the state. Does, um, so does that apply? That protection apply tonight? Mm -hmm. Jeez, do with that? Does that a, a protection mm -hmm. apply? Mm -hmm. they're, they're not registered with the state. Mm -hmm. This no. way. It should state. still apply though. You can't touch them at this point. The loans is obviously a cemetery. You know, I mean, you can't dispute that it's a cemetery. Uh -huh. uh, there should not be. Yeah, as long as it's got some sort of marking, it could, you know, as long as it's some sort of marking that you recognize as a cemetery. That was a lot of the trouble with the Gullah Geechee Nation. Um, their beliefs were not to mark the cemetery. They would uh, just give offerings. So you'd go out and break. So their belief is if you broke something, it could be taken to the next life. So they would go out and break bottles and dishes and things like that over the specific graves, but no other marker. So essentially to everybody else, it looks like a field of trash. And the courts didn't side with them, and they demolished most of their cemeteries. If you ever go to play golf in Hilton Head Island, most all the golf courses are on top of cemeteries because they couldn't prove they were formally marked in any way. So as long as they have a headstone or something, at least one, you can formally mark and that's a reason a lot of people also got rid of in their farms. So the reason a lot of them threw headstones in the gullies was so they could get rid of the formal marking and say, I don't know what cemetery you're talking about. Um, yeah, what, what headstones? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a sign in sheet that's going around.
And one more uh, thing I wanted to point out real quick is I have some of the um, the forms up here. Uh, we get asked a lot about cemetery uh, restoration assistance for the Cherokee Nation. Um, what you need to do is a, get an association together, get a couple people that want to help save an abandoned cemetery, uh, do some maintenance work on it. And Cherokee Nation actually does provide $500 a year um, to help maintain a cemetery. You just have to prove that they're 51% um, Cherokees in there. So I think most people in here know that, but I do have some of the forms that it also has to show you how to get set up at the 501c3 and all of that. So how, uh, how do you prove that?